It's Friday, December 2nd, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, Arizona iced tea is joining the hard beverage movement. Pepsi is joining Big Milk. And scientists have got some new practical tips for training your body to wake up earlier and actually alert. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. The brands are at it again. Ramping up for the holiday and end-of-year market has got them causing all sorts of mischief. Arizona Iced Tea, the company famous for its garishly decorated tall boy cans of forever 99-cent flavored teas, tweeted simply yesterday, We're hard. The tweet was accompanied by a meme, the one of the stick figure eating cereal and then spitting it out in disbelief, and in this case, the meme was showcasing how Arizona Iced Tea now has a hard, as in alcoholic, line. The company hasn't revealed any more details just yet, but I should note that the hard tea line was actually released over the summer in Canada, debuting at a 90s-themed pop-up in Quebec in August, hosted by creative agency Mischief. The 5% alcohol teas are a collaboration with Molson Coors, at least in Canada. No word yet on details here in the U.S., like when they'll launch, who they'll partner with. Presumably, they'll be in the same four flavors offered in Canada, lemon, peach, ginseng and honey, and a half tea, half lemonade. All we do know for sure is that they won't be 99 cents a can. In reply to that expected question on Twitter, Arizona Ice Tea said, quote, that's a public safety hazard. End quote. But on the even weirder end of the spectrum, Pepsi is trying to make pilk a thing. Pilk, P I L K, that is Pepsi mixed with milk. And actually, even though people are very divided on the idea of pilk, Pepsi doesn't have much work to do on making it a thing. It already was a thing before they launched a big marketing campaign around it yesterday. So as far as I can tell from some very cursory research, Pilk first appeared in an episode of Laverne and Shirley. Laverne is seen adding Pepsi to a huge bucket of milk in an attempt to drink her problems away. Now, what I wasn't able to determine just yet was if this was a recognized combination by audiences at the time or something completely random that the screenwriters just made up. Either way, that gag in Laverne and Shirley led a small number of folks over the decades to try it out themselves, usually to underwhelming results. Since 2014, Pilk has popped up online here and there, YouTube creators making and reacting to it, Redditors posting photos of it for outrage karma. It had a moderate resurgence in 2020, but really ramped up in the last couple of weeks this year as it took over TikTok. There are tons of videos over there right now of people trying the soda and milk combo or applying it to their particular account's niche, like some guy plugging his guitar into Pilk, another one leaving a bottle of Pilk in his shed to see what happens over time, and Mythical Kitchen using Pilk to make cheese. That one did not look appetizing at all. Seeing this organic trend bubbling up, and potentially having even longer foresight of the more broad, dirty soda trend that is ramped up on TikTok as people discover the popular Mormon tradition of combining creamer, syrups, and more with soda, Pepsi themselves launched a campaign yesterday to get people to try Pilk and Cookies. Dropping a series of commercials starring Lindsay Lohan and Santa Claus, the company has also launched a sweepstakes for fans to win cash prizes in exchange for sharing their pilk creations on social media. Chief Marketing Officer Todd Kaplan said in the press release, quote, Combining Pepsi and milk has long been a secret hack among Pepsi fans. Now, with the rise of the dirty soda trend on TikTok and throughout the country, we thought Pilk and Cookies would be a great way to unapologetically celebrate the holidays with a new and delicious way to enjoy Pepsi this season. End quote. Long been a secret hack among Pepsi fans. Maybe. Again, which came first, Laverne and Shirley or Pilk? I do still want to figure out how much Pepsi themselves as a company had a hand in creating this recipe back in the 70s or 80s. 
You may know or remember from our 2020 episode about Hot Dr. Pepper, the basically mold wine version of Dr. Pepper that the soda company tried to popularize back in the 1960s as a way to keep their sales up during the cold winter months. So my first thought when I saw Pilk was that it was a similar strategy. You know, to the extent that soda sales still lag in December, I'm not positive about that, but if they do, this is just another way for them to capitalize on cozy holiday cheer. Maybe there's some truth in all of that, maybe not, but here's the really important question. Is milk and Pepsi good? Not according to most people trying it on the internet. Steffi Cow subjected the entire BuzzFeed newsroom to pilk, and the reactions were less than stellar. Quote, The pilk I made smelled really bad, like the sole of a rubber shoe that's been sweat in a little, like a pile of damp laundry that's just beginning to dry but isn't yet. The smell is the kind of bad you want to keep smelling. Many tried to find comparisons, sort of just a thick soda, sort of like someone who's never had an egg cream trying to describe it to you. The common conclusions, though, were that it's best forgettable and, at worst, violently gross. End quote. Here's the thing, though. In the photo posted with that article, cow seems to have been using oat milk for the drink, not real cow's milk. I'm no chemist, but I feel like there's got to be some elements of real milk that help make pilk actually good. I mean, after all, as Cow herself points out, soda and milk combinations are nothing new. Egg cream sodas, root beer floats, those are great. And of course, there's the whole dirty soda trend that I mentioned. But again, dirty soda uses real milk. And not just milk, but often heavy cream, flavored syrups, and sometimes fruit or whipped cream toppings. That's a lot of sugar, fat, and decadence, not some watered-down oat milk. And that's the primary reason I am not trying this for this segment just yet. I'm lactose intolerant, so I can't try it with real milk, and I feel like I might be missing out on something. I might pick up some lactate milk and Pepsi and give it a go later, but in general, I think all the people writing this off who didn't use the actual ingredients didn't get the full experience. Even Pepsi themselves hint at just milk and Pepsi not being the best. In their press release, they share five different pilk recipes, each to be paired with a different cookie. There's versions with heavy cream, chocolate milk, caramel creamer, and all manner of different Pepsi products. Two of the recipes are actually dairy-free. There's the Nutty Cracker, which uses almond milk and coconut creamer, along with a Nitro Pepsi Vanilla. And there is an oat milk version, the Snow Float, but that one calls for four whole tablespoons of caramel creamer, not just the unflavored oat milk that was in the office fridge. And this is another thing Pilk has in common with Hot Dr. Pepper. A lot of people try it and post their reactions online, showing how gross they think it is, but they're all using the standard Dr. Pepper you find on most grocery store shelves. The actual recipe calls for the real sugar version of Dr. Pepper, not the corn syrup one. It's tough to find up north, and these days would defeat the purpose of boosting Dr. Pepper sales since you can't just use the easiest to find product, and like proper pilk requires a bit more effort than just adding one extra ingredient to your soda, but if you want the promised delicious experience, that's the way to do it. If I do try one of the lactose-free versions of Pilk or learn more about its origins, I will be sure to share it here or on social media. But for now, I am curious, have any of you tried Pilk or Hot Dr. Pepper? Please report back. If you are not a morning person, this segment is for you. A new University of California Berkeley study has confirmed three factors that make a difference in being able to wake up alert and refreshed. And while those three factors, sleep, exercise, and what you eat for breakfast, are nothing new, the exact details of their findings were fairly intriguing. So the research team studied 833 people over a two-week period, including a few sets of identical and fraternal twins to help differentiate genetic and environmental variables. 
The participants were given watches that recorded their sleep, glucose, and physical activity, and asked to keep records of their food intake and general alertness at various points in the day. They were also assigned different breakfast meals for the duration of the study. Now, generally, the researchers found that the more you exercise the day before, the more alert you will be the next morning. The longer or later that you sleep, the more alert you'll be. And if you eat a low-sugar breakfast rich in complex carbohydrates with a moderate amount of protein, you'll be more alert. Now, their breakfast findings there were particularly intriguing. Quoting Berkeley News, The worst type of breakfast, on average, contained high amounts of simple sugar. It was associated with an inability to wake up effectively and maintain alertness. When given this sugar-infused breakfast, participants struggled with sleepiness. In contrast, the high-carbohydrate breakfast, which contained large amounts of carbohydrates as opposed to simple sugar and only a modest amount of protein, was linked to individuals revving up their alertness quickly in the morning and sustaining that alert state. We've known for some time that a diet high in sugar is harmful to sleep, not to mention being toxic for the cells in your brain and body, said senior author Matthew Walker, UC Berkeley professor of neuroscience and psychology. However, what we've discovered is that beyond these harmful effects on sleep, consuming high amounts of sugar in your breakfast and having a spike in blood sugar following any type of breakfast meal markedly blunts your brain's ability to return to waking consciousness following sleep. End quote. And that is the interesting part of this study to me. It wasn't a study about how to wake up early or how to be the most healthy. It was about being mentally alert when you do wake up. And in fact, the study almost points towards not waking up earlier. They found that letting yourself have a lion contributed towards waking up more alert than not. Quoting again, According to Walker, between seven and nine hours of sleep is ideal for ridding the body of sleep inertia, the inability to transition effectively to a state of functional cognitive alertness upon awakening. Most people need this amount of sleep to remove a chemical called adenosine that accumulates in the body throughout the day and brings on sleepiness in the evening, something known as sleep pressure. Considering that the majority of individuals in society are not getting enough sleep during the week, sleeping longer on a given day can help clear some of the adenosine sleepiness debt they are carrying, Walker speculated. In addition, sleeping later can help with alertness for a second reason, he said. When you wake up later, you're rising at a higher point on the upswing of your 24-hour circadian rhythm, which ramps up throughout the morning and boosts alertness, end quote. And while a strong independent correlation was found between physical activity and alertness upon waking the next day, the study did not yet find a reason for that correlation, and their speculation is nothing new. Exercise has been shown to help you sleep better and improve your mood, two things that could help you sleep better and therefore feel more alert the next day. But going back to this study's inclusion of twins in the participant sample— With those findings, the researchers found that genetics play only a minor and insignificant role in waking alertness. Given this, the team says, if you've never been a morning person, don't give up hope. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's just the way you are. There are tangible steps you can take towards becoming more alert in the mornings. Now, this doesn't wholly pair with other research, which says that we all have natural chronotypes or natural inclinations to sleep at certain times. However, even proponents of chronotypes do say that we can train our circadian rhythms to adhere to a different schedule. An inverse recently interviewed clinical psychologist and sleep specialist Whitney Roban about just this method. Quoting inverse, When the sun goes down, the lack of light and colder temperature signals the body to release melatonin, a hormone associated with sleep. However, artificial light and heat mean our circadian rhythms aren't as strictly governed by the sun as they once were. Things like light, warmth, and exercise in the evening can all trick our circadian rhythm into operating in daytime mode. Instead of releasing melatonin, the body can release glucose, something sure to keep you awake. When you're trying to get on a sleep-wake schedule more akin to a morning person's, sleep hygiene and early morning activities matter. End quote. 
So, for example, if you are a night owl trying to get on an earlier wake-up schedule, you'll want to do all those things you're always hearing about for good sleep hygiene a little earlier in the evening. Avoiding alcohol close to bedtime or caffeine any time after lunch. Avoid electronics before bed and create a cooler bedroom temperature. It's about trying to create an environment more similar to that natural pre-industrial, you could say, one that most of us live in now. And quoting further, beginning with a quote from Robin, Research shows it takes about six weeks to adjust to an earlier sleep schedule. So if you usually go to sleep at 1 a.m. and now want to fall asleep at 11 p.m., you have to be consistent, not just with your sleep time, but also with your wake-up time, she says. Roban advises shifting when you fall asleep and wake up in slow increments, maybe 15 or 20 minutes earlier every night, for several weeks. So if you're trying to go to bed two hours earlier, from midnight to 10 p.m., you'd go to bed at 11.45 p.m. the first night, 11.30 the second, 11.15 the third, 11 the fourth, and so on, when you've hit your target bedtime, stick to it." End quote. My mom actually used to make us do this at the end of summer vacation when we were growing up. You know, after two and a half months of late nights and even later mornings, she'd make us start going to bed and waking up about 15 minutes earlier each day for a week or two before school started. Now, of course, the big key to this, the one that is super difficult for a lot of us to adhere to because we often end up in a self-defeating cycle with that sleep debt that Walker mentioned, is that you have to stick to the same sleep schedule on weekends. If you trained your body to go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 7 a.m., you're going to ruin that training if you stay up until 1 on Friday and sleep in until 10 on Saturday. And like the Berkeley study, Roban says that what you do in the morning once you wake up really matters. Basically, do the opposite of what you did at night. Get yourself some natural light, some caffeine, a big glass of water, do a bit of exercise to get your body moving, and eat a good breakfast rich in complex carbohydrates. It's a lot to keep in mind or try to train yourself to do for something that seems as basic as sleeping and waking up, you know, something humans and other animals have been doing for eons. But we also live in a world that's constantly fighting against our natural instincts. You know, all that stuff I mentioned, it would have just happened naturally back in the day. No screens with distractions and blue light to keep you awake. In the earliest days, no coffee or alcohol to mess with your circadian rhythm. And most importantly, no job that was forcing you to wake up before you were ready or stay up later than you wanted. So with all of those obstacles and obligations, it makes sense that we have to put extra work into sleep. As Walker from the Berkeley study put it, quote, If you pause to think, it is a non-trivial accomplishment to go from being non-conscious, recumbent, and immobile to being a thoughtful, conscious, attentive, and productive human being, active, awake, and mobile. It's unlikely that such a radical, fundamental change is simply going to be explained by tweaking one single thing. However, we have discovered that there are still some basic, modifiable, yet powerful ingredients to the awakening equation that people can focus on. A relatively simple prescription for how best to wake up each day. End quote. Well, that is going to be it from me for this week. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again on Monday.